You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. Hello, and welcome to episode 350 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Before the American Revolution became a war and a fight for independence, the revolution was a movement and protest for more local control of government. But how did the revolution get started? Who worked to transform a series of protests into a revolution? Well, this is a big question with no one answer. One of the Americans who worked largely behind the scenes to warn colonists about imperial overreach and to foment revolution was a Boston politician named Samuel Adams. Stacey Schiff, a Pulitzer Prize-winning author, has just published a new biography of Adams called The Revolutionary Samuel Adams. And she joins us so that we can explore and investigate Adams' life and contributions that turned protest into revolution. Now, during our investigation of Samuel Adams, Stacey reveals what we know about Samuel Adams' life and education, how Adams made politics his career and his successes and failures in politics, and some of the work that Adams did to transform protests and debates over imperial taxation into a revolution for social and political change. But first, I have some really exciting news to share with you. Ben Franklin's World is now a part of the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation and its new Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. In early January, I joined the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation as its new founding director of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios, where my job is to build and lead a team that will create all sorts of digital content and programs for Colonial Williamsburg. And one of our big projects, the one I'm really excited about, is to build a virtual museum all about early American history, broadly speaking, just like we investigate on this podcast. Now, Ben Franklin's world is a big piece of this work. And Holly White and I, Yes, Holly has joined me at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. Holly White and I will continue to produce this podcast just as we've always produced it. It will continue to come out every other Tuesday, and it will continue to offer you access to exciting stories and research about early American history and provide you with access to the scholars who uncover those stories and conduct that research. So the only changes you'll hear are the new start and end of show announcements where we talk about Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios, And you'll hear more information about exhibits and events going on at Colonial Williamsburg in our mid-roll announcements. Plus, you'll also be the first to know about the new digital programs that we create in addition to this podcast. I'm wicked excited about this new opportunity and for Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios to become the longtime home of Ben Franklin's world. Okay, are you ready to dig into the details of the life and deeds of Samuel Adams? Let's go meet our guest historian. Our guest is a multiple award and Pulitzer Prize winning author who has written six books. Her books include The Witches, Salem 1692, and her George Washington Book Prize and Ambassador Award winning book, A Great Improvisation. Franklin, France, and the Birth of America. Our guest has held fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Today, she joins us to discuss her latest book, The Revolutionary, Samuel Adams. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Stacey Schiff. Thank you so much, Liz. Now, Stacey's latest book, The Revolutionary, traces the life of one of the more famous founders from Boston, Massachusetts, Samuel Adams. Stacey, I wonder if we could start with what drew you to research and write a biography about Adams and what your research revealed about how we should refer to him. Was he Samuel, Sam, or just Mr. Adams? I would say two things really converged, and I'm not sure with which I began. It was 2016, so as were many of us, I was thinking a lot about the origins of America and what we meant when we talked about democracy. And I had gone back for various reasons to look at a book I had written years ago on Benjamin Franklin and was surprised to find Samuel Adams lurking there. He has a cameo in that book. I had sort of introduced him and not really gone into any depth with him. 
which was sort of a curious thing to me. Usually I'm fairly familiar with the supporting cast. And in this case, I was somewhat taken aback by this surprising presence on the page. And sort of perpendicular to that thought was the fact that I was coming off of this book on the Salem Witch Trials, The Witches. And I had been really pondering the question of who had the courage at the end of 1692 to raise a hand and object to the witchcraft court, which was a very dangerous thing to do. As soon as you expressed any skepticism about witchcraft that year, you were generally rewarded with an accusation of witchcraft. So it was not something that one did lightly. And the first people who spoke up, spoke up quietly, anonymously, delicately. And one of those people, it was Thomas Brattle, reminded me as I began to read about Samuel Adams of Adams in the sense that these were men of staunch and firm opinions with moral compasses that were sort of beyond compare. And so those were really the two roads that converged. I will add that it was particularly mortifying to me to discover how little I knew about Samuel Adams because I was born in Adams, Massachusetts. So you'd think I might have had some inkling as to what he had done with his life. And in answer to your question about the name, he seems always to be addressed by his contemporaries as Samuel. He becomes Sam Adams when he's derided later by his critics. He becomes Sam Adams on the beer bottle. So obviously that prevails. And I think there's a little bit of confusion because he signs his name sometimes, as he does on the declaration, as Sam period with a little squiggle for the rest of the name in very much the same way that Thomas might sign his name, T-O-M, with a little squiggle for the rest of Thomas. And so I think people just assumed that he was signing his name Sam. But he does seem to have been addressed by his contemporaries as Samuel Adams. And it's always interesting to point out how the Sam Adams on the beer bottle, if you really look at it, looks like Samuel Adams' face photoshopped onto John Singleton Copley's portrait of Paul Revere. I mean, he looks very much like an artisan there. It does seem to be one of those like creatures you took out of the little children's flip books where you put the tail of one creature onto the beak of another. Exactly. Now, as the revolutionary is a biography and biographies tend to start at the beginnings of their subjects' lives, I think we should start there too. Would you tell us what we know about Samuel Adams' childhood and early life? He is written off later by his critics, by most of the Crown officers, as something of a desperado, as a penniless man whose ambitions have not panned out. But in fact, he's a very different creature. He's a man who grew up amid wealth. He grows up in a sort of splendid house overlooking Boston Harbor with a beautiful orchard and observatory and a wharf with the Adams name on it. Goes to the best schools. He's educated at Boston Latin. He will later go to Harvard and get a second degree, as did many people. He has a master's from Harvard as well. He is when he is at Harvard, which is ranked very carefully. Massachusetts is a very hierarchical place at this point. He is in the top quarter of his class, which says something about one's father's stature. So his father was a justice of the peace. For that reason, he ranks amid the top boys in his class. So he grows up really amid privilege, but is fairly soon thereafter downwardly mobile for reasons we can talk about. He gets the best education available in the colonies in those years. It's an education which goes long on the classics. He's really steeped in Homer and Livy and Sallust and Cicero. He learns how to write a syllogism. He's translating back and forth between the Latin and the Greek. He takes the obligatory course at Harvard in Hebrew. So he really has a very classical education. And you will see the accents and the illusions of that education often much later in his writing. I'm glad you brought up his ranking at Harvard because that was based on wealth of his father. And even today, we think of college as an opportunity to network and build relationships with people who you can really call on throughout your life and career. And it was certainly viewed as that even back in the 18th century. And as Boston was such a small town in the 1740s, was there anyone that we would know in Samuel Adams's Harvard class that would have been there to help Adams during his years as a revolutionary? Interestingly, no. And he seems to have been the sole revolutionary in his class. Obviously, that will change later. One thing that I did to get a sense of the preoccupations and the politics of Boston in those years was to look very carefully at something which has been researched before, which is the subjects of the master's theses at Harvard. And if you actually look at those theses, you see that Adams, who picks for his subject a very political topic, is in the minority. Most people are not actually picking political subjects. They're much more tending toward the religious. And those topics in themselves are a kind of x-ray of the colonial mind. They're really fascinating. And they can make it seem as if on the one hand, 
Some questions are eternal, like, you know, do the ends justify the means? Do we meet our friends when we go to heaven? And on other counts, as if the 18th century is a very great distance away. I mean, somebody writes on the question of whether vegetables breathe. There are a lot of theses on the existence of angels. The question comes up about whether the Pope is indeed the Antichrist. Was the sun inhabitable? I mean, the questions are, you know, to our minds, extremely far-fetched in many ways. But to have picked a political topic in Samuel Adams's age, which is to say in 1743, was quite unusual. And that fits with what other scholars have said about Samuel Adams, that he was very drawn to politics at an early age. And so I think it's both interesting and makes perfect sense, right, that he would write his master's thesis about politics. Now, as you've done a lot of research into these Harvard theses, and specifically Samuel Adams' thesis, in episode 152, we spoke with historian Bernard Balin about the ideological origins of the American Revolution, which is this book that argues that the American Revolution was primarily caused by ideas about politics. So historians like Balin argue that revolutionaries like Samuel Adams were classically educated and really had a deep understanding of Greek and Roman ideas about democracy and politics, and that's what led them to seek reforms and revolution within the British imperial and colonial government. So Stacey, did you get a sense from your reading of Adams' thesis or in any of his other papers about how his readings of Livy, Cato, and his other Greek, Hebrew, and Latin readings shaped how he viewed and thought about politics? With Adams in particular, it's hard to draw a direct line because we have so little from his early years. We know the subject of that thesis. We see what I'm quite sure is a longer version of it in one of his early newspaper pieces in the Independent Advertiser in the 1740s. And then we see him sort of blossoming completely with the sugar and the stamp acts. So there's a somewhat, I guess I would say there's a sort of perforated line among those three. Very early on, he is a proponent of the idea that no man should stand above the law and no man should stand below it. And that ambition and, as he puts it, avarice are the enemies of good government. And probably along those same lines, that the power of the government should stand in perfect equipoise with the rights of the subjects. That's really the gist of where he is in the 1740s and pretty much all we will know about his political convictions until the 1760s. But those are the ideas with which he seems to be playing in the independent advertiser pieces. There are a lot of sort of variations on the theme, obviously. Those are all that unusual for writings of the time. He's by no means the only one who's on that page. When we read Stacey's book, The Revolutionary, we'll learn that Samuel Adams came into his adulthood during the 1740s, and that after he graduated from Harvard with his master's degree in 1743, he married his first wife, Elizabeth Checkley, in 1749. Stacey, What did Adams do after writing his thesis and attending Harvard? And what do we know about his courtship and marriage to Elizabeth Checkley? Let me talk about Elizabeth first. And this is one of those disappointments to the biographer. When two people are in the same place for an extended period of time, they don't write to each other. (laughs) And so the record goes cold. So we know relatively little about the first Mrs. Samuel Adams. She is the daughter of the Adams family's minister. The two families have been very close. Samuel Adams Sr. had helped the Reverend Checkley to actually come to his post at their church. Adams probably had known Elizabeth most of her life. They would have been several blocks from each other through most of their early years. It seems as if it's a very happy marriage. She's clearly bereft when she dies over a very short marriage of essentially eight years. They lose four children and have a son and a daughter who do survive, which is pretty much par for the course in those days. And he waits a very long time to remarry, which is somewhat interesting and for which we have no real explanation. I think Paul Revere waits for five months between wives and Samuel Adams goes seven years as a single parent before he remarries. But we have only little traces of Elizabeth Checkley Adams. What he does during those years, we have a little bit more of a record of, and it's truly an undistinguished record. He essentially seems able to squander any amount of money quickly. So he inherits a certain sum of money from his father, which he loses. He briefly works in an accounting house. It's run by Thomas Cushing, who's a very popular Bostonian and a friend of the family's. And very quickly, Cushing determines that Adams is a very capable young man, but is wholly obsessed with politics and unable to deal with the ledgers in the accounting firm. And he essentially invites Adams to leave. So he loses that position. 
And he really is sort of casting about living on what seems to be air, save for some minor Boston town positions over these years. His family has been wrecked financially, so there's no real fortune to fall back on through these years. How was it that Samuel Adams, who seems to be this very intelligent, well-read individual, squandered away the money that put him in the top 25% of his Harvard class, which, as you mentioned, was really a rank based on one's economic wealth. It sounds like Adams came from a really well-to-do family that really should have enabled him to parlay his family's wealth into greater wealth. So why was he so broke and bad with money? I think there are two things at work here. But the first of them is insofar as he demonstrates pride, and he's a very humble and modest and diffident man. He is proud of the fact that he has neither many earthly possessions nor any sort of great ambition. There's a purity to that, which is a purity he always applauds in other people. He really almost foams at the mouth sometimes when he sees people accumulating fortunes. And he does seem to believe from a very early point that the honest politician, the effective politician, the politician who has the common wheel at heart is the impoverished man or is the man who is in no way profiting in any case from his position. But the other answer to your question is the land bank. Samuel Adams Sr. is one of nine directors of a banking venture, which begins in 1740, essentially to address the problem of there being no hard currency in New England. And this has been a long time problem. Many solutions have been proposed. It has very much crippled the New England economy, which is already on the decline through these years. And so to address that problem, Adams and these other eight men come up with the idea of securing a new form of currency with land, because they're very rich in land, but very poor in currency. And they run this idea past the then governor, Governor Belcher, who is a great proponent of it. And they get the venture off the ground. And no sooner have they done so, very successfully, in fact, than the merchant elite in Boston begin to complain about the land bank for two reasons. First of all, because it has opened up the hierarchical ranks of who's important. I mean, suddenly there are these innkeepers and glass industry people who want in with the real elite of Boston. And also because they, of course, don't want these bills which are worthless for them to use with their English creditors. So this is watering down the monetary supply. And they complain to Governor Belcher, who does his best himself to quash the land bank, but also writes in a very histrionic way to London to say, you know, this is just further proof of how obstreperous these Americans have become. The government is going to be overturned if you don't stop this. He evokes comparisons to the South Sea bubble. And he basically demands that Parliament instantly shut down the land bank, which is done in a very peremptory piece of legislation, which will bankrupt Samuel Adams Sr. because he's deeply invested in the bank. And essentially, each of those directors, each of those nine men is held responsible jointly and severally for the debts of the bank. So this leaves Samuel Adams Jr. after the death of his father, essentially having to fight off the creditors who try to essentially repossess the home in repayment for the land bank debt. So for a good decade afterwards, everyone is trying to untangle the very complicated accounts of the land bank quite unsuccessfully, but no one is fighting it quite so vociferously as is Samuel Adams. We're going to come back to the land bank. But first, you said earlier that Adams was a fairly humble individual. And When you walk through downtown Boston today and you see the colonists giving Freedom Trail tours, you can often overhear them telling their guests that Samuel Adams was a very devout Puritan and actually a teetotaler. He didn't really drink alcohol a whole lot, according to these guides. Stacey, I wonder if you could discuss the role that religion played in Adams's life, because he does seem to be, based on what you've said, a pretty devout individual. You know, the teetotaling, the only thing I can trace it to, there's a remark of John Adams. John Adams and Samuel Adams are second cousins. John is younger. And John does remark on the fact that Samuel is very abstemious. In Philadelphia as well, it will be said that he doesn't eat very much, that he's very careful. He seems to live on ideas at all times. But I have no evidence he's a perfect teetotaler just in his defense, if indeed that's a defense. In terms of the religion, it seems to be everywhere absolutely with him. He's immensely devout. When critics want to make fun of him later, they will refer to him as the psalm singer. The idea that If a church can exist without a bishop, then a state can exist without a king, central to his thinking. He's very fond of religious allegory and religious remarks. He often cites scripture in his letters. So it does seem an organizing principle for him, as it does, I think, for many of his friends, for much of his circle in Boston, in the sense that republicanism is a kind of secularized puritanism. 
So it seems like religion must have fueled and informed a lot of Adams' political ideas. Even when he's writing about his marriage, he tends to make religious allusions. It really does seem very much an organizing principle. His letters are really rich in religious allusions. Now, in 1747, Samuel Adams began his life in public service. The townspeople of Boston elected him their market clerk. Stacy, we need to take a quick moment to thank our episode sponsor. And then I'd really like for us to investigate what it is that Adams did as the market clerk and whether he even ran for this office or the townspeople just elected him to it. You may recall that last year, in episode 331, we explored the extraordinary history and rediscovery of the Williamsburg Bray School. The Williamsburg Bray School was an 18th century institution dedicated to educating enslaved and free Black children, and the original building that housed the Bray School was rediscovered on William and Mary's University campus just a few years ago. In episode 331, one of our guest historians, Ronald Hurst, told us how in 2023, William Mary and the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation would move the Bray School building from William and Mary's campus to the Colonial Williamsburg Historic Area so that the building can be restored and open to the public for visitation as part of the Colonial Williamsburg Living History Museum. Well, in just about 10 days, on February 10, 2023, the Williamsburg Bray School will embark on its journey to its new home and the Colonial Williamsburg Historic Area. And you are invited to come watch this historic move and to attend the festivities. The move of the building will begin on Williamsburg's Prince Street at 8.30 a.m. on February 10. The building will travel from Prince Street to North Boundary Street through the Richmond and Jamestown Road intersection to its new home at the corner of West Francis Street and North Nassau Street. At 2 p.m., you're invited to attend a ceremony commemorating the Bray School that will take place on the lawn of the Art Museums of Colonial Williamsburg, and there'll be free parking available in the Art Museum's parking lot. I know this is a lot of information, but it's something exciting. So I've included a link in the show notes for more information about this move that'll have all the details you need to attend. I really hope you can join us, and I look forward to seeing you there. Stacy, what did the Office of Market Clerk require of Adams? And was this even an office that Adams stood for election for, or... Did his fellow townspeople just elect him to this position? You know, I should say before I mention the market clerk, that is something that does distinguish him from his peers, which is that he has no occupation, he has no profession, which makes it harder later for people to mock him when he begins to pick up lots of Tory critics. They really have no way to sort of quantify who this person is because he does devote himself 100% to politics. He really is sort of a first professional politician in that respect. He takes a job as a market clerk, which was a very minor Boston position. Massachusetts has this incredibly intricate set of public offices. Everything is surveilled by one keeper or watcher after another. And a market clerk would have been sort of the initial point of entry. It was a very lowly position. It would essentially have been incumbent on him to check that prices were correct, that weights were correct, that everything was orderly and fresh in the marketplace. It would have sent him out into the streets which may account for the beginnings of how well he knows his fellow townsmen, because he does seem to be one of these people who connect the educated elite with the man in the street. We have no sense of how well he performed that job. It was not unusual for someone who was a Harvard graduate to take that position. He doesn't then begin to climb the ranks as one might have done after that. But he does hold other elective offices. He, uncommonly for a Harvard graduate, becomes a tax collector. And at that, he manages to fail spectacularly. There's probably no position for which he could have been so splendidly unsuited in the sense that he really did not have any mind for counting. As I said, he probably takes the tax collecting position. It's very unclear why he would have accepted it. It was the kind of town position that one generally paid a fine rather than having to accept. Nobody wanted to be the person who had to collect taxes. Very likely he took it because at this point he has a young family to support and he really does need some source of income. It is hinted that perhaps he took the position or was put up for the position because his goodwill could be relied on and everybody wants a very indulgent tax collector. The way that the position worked at the time was that a tax collector got a premium on the monies that he collected. But on the other hand, if he failed to deliver those monies, he actually needed to supply them himself. So there was actually a debt to be paid if he failed in his collecting. I should say in his defense as well, Adams takes this on at a time when 
there is economic distress in Boston, but in his ward in particular, there is a smallpox epidemic and a fire. So it's a very difficult time. But that said, he does manage to run up twice as much debt as the next most delinquent collector. His debt at a certain point is 8,000 pounds, extraordinary sum of money, which some friends help him defray because the amount is so ridiculously high. But he will, in fact, be in trouble at several times nearly essentially sued by the colony because he has failed to produce these money. So he either was an incredibly ineffective or a very indulgent collector, but either way, it did not bode well for his future. You know, there's this urban legend in Boston that the people kept electing Samuel Adams as their tax collector because he just never collected the taxes. Well, there is this question of why, since he's failing at it so brilliantly, he just ups again year after year for, I think it's six years, in fact. So yes, there may well be some truth to that. Many biographers of American founders work to identify moments when the person in their study turned into a revolutionary. And Stacy's biography, The Revolutionary, is really no different. Stacy, like Samuel Adams' younger cousin, John Adams, you trace Samuel Adams' transformation into a revolutionary and attribute that transformation to the Massachusetts Land Bank fiasco of 1740 and 1741. So would you tell us a bit more about the Massachusetts land bank fiasco and how and why you think it was this event that played a large role in transforming Samuel Adams into a revolutionary? I would be a little bit careful of drawing a direct line from one to the other. Certainly, it sets up the kind of confrontation with parliamentary authority that he will find so objectionable later. And this is precisely the kind of overreach, the idea that parliament can reach across the ocean in a single gesture can shut down an American venture. That seemed obviously objectionable to him. It obviously has a parallel later with the Sugar and the Stamp Acts. You know, can the colonies who have no representation in London really fall under British legislation in this way? But he himself never connects the two. The only connection that gets made is made actually by both John Adams and Thomas Hutchinson later in comparing the uproar and the unrest that the Stamp Act will provoke with the kind of bitterness that the land bank catastrophe will unleash as well. So I would draw sort of a perforated line between those two. Certainly the sensitivity to colonial rights, the sense that these are liberties that are on the one hand hallowed and on the other hand easily curtailed or undermined is there from the start. So what line do you think we can trace for how Samuel Adams becomes a staunch revolutionary? How does he go from his ideas about parliamentary overreach with the land bank to what would happen in the 1760s with the Stamp Act and the Sugar Act and the Tea Act. Because my understanding of Adams and the revolution is exactly something that you stated in the book, The Revolutionary, which is that Samuel Adams was a stage manager of the revolution, that he orchestrated and fomented not only the revolutionary spirit in Boston, but also elsewhere in the colonies. You see him in his first act really around the time of the Sugar and the Stamp Acts, where he is a little bit behind the scenes still, but he is polishing the prose of James Otis, who really is his political mentor at that point. And that's where Adams begins to sort of come out from behind the curtain. He is the first to write a salvo against imperial authority when he sees this legislation coming down the pike and is the first to essentially question how this can possibly apply to the colonies. And he draws that equation, of course, with, you know, if stamps can be imposed upon us, if paper can be taxed, why can our land not be taxed? And if our land is taxed, why not our lives, everything we obtain from the land? He opens the whole question up to make it more accessible so that everyone can see that this is a much larger issue and begins to wrestle these ideas really onto the page. It's with the Stamp Act that he is first elected to the Massachusetts House of Representatives, almost as, it seems anyway, as a direct fallout to becoming the voice of this opposition. And once in the Massachusetts House, And this we know from the governor and the crown officials, the house begins to speak largely with his voice. And that's where you really begin to first get a sense of him sort of massaging ideas and trying to align men and maneuvering quite a bit behind the scenes. And some of the answer to your question is why we think of him as a stage manager is that that's largely the way he's painted, not only by the Thomas Hutchinsons and the Francis Bernards, but also by Thomas Jefferson later at the Continental Congress. But one of his first acts on entering the Massachusetts House is with friends, he will arrange for a gallery to be built in the House of Representatives. 
The idea being that the people should be able to observe their elected representatives in action, and the representative should know that they are being observed by their constituents. And, you know, it seems to us, it's like putting cameras in Congress. It seems to us like a fairly natural evolution. But it was at the time, especially to the royal governor, quite a shocking thing. And Francis Bernard, who's then governor, essentially asks if this means that the House of Representatives will now become a theater because the representatives now tend to sort of speak to the gallery and to perform for the gallery. And to make matters worse, Adams keeps inviting his friends to sit in the gallery. So, you know, how is that shaping Massachusetts government and Massachusetts opinions henceforth? I don't think many of us knew that James Otis Jr. was Samuel Adams's political mentor. Could you tell us more about James Otis, who's this really fascinating figure and was the person that John Adams later identified as a catalyst of the revolution when he argued the writs of assistance case in 1761. And writs of assistance were this blanket type of search warrant that did not need approval from a judge to enact and basically allowed Crown officials to search any and all property and premises where someone was suspected of smuggling. So Otis is actually a little bit younger than Samuel Adams, but seems to have been his mentor insofar as Adams had a mentor. And certainly Adams comes to the forefront in, as I said, in burnishing the prose of Otis, who is a verbally pyrotechnic speaker, a brilliant lawyer, as we know, argues the writs of assistance case brilliantly in front of Thomas Hutchinson, of all people, but who will then slowly begin to succumb to some kind of mental illness. It's hard to say what it is, but it sounds from all accounts like some kind of mania, which will leave him both unable to contain his incredible verbal gift so he can speak for, as John Adams tells us, hours on end without drawing breath, but also simultaneously on both sides of the aisle. So he'll have Tory days and he'll have Whig days. He'll have days where he talks about how loyal he is to the king and then days where he, you know, is shooting pistols out his window madly and then days where he essentially is undermining the Stamp Act and days where he's supporting the Stamp Act. So he becomes a kind of wild card. And it is incumbent upon Adams to both contain the damage to maintain the deference of their mutual friends. There's a very poignant letter in which he talks about how one should be very gentle with Otis, to assign Otis to committees where he can do relatively little harm, and to continue the cause that obviously the two men had shared at one point without in any way either offending Otis or compromising him. Until about 1768, Otis is referred to by the Crown officers who dislike him as the chief incendiary. And after 1768, Adams really takes over that role. At that point, Otis has really kind of taken second place to Adams. So timeline-wise, we're now in the mid to late 1760s. The Sugar Act came down in 1764. The Stamp Act crisis took place in 1765. And we can now picture Samuel Adams at this point in time as someone who is representing his constituents in the Massachusetts General Court or its House of Representatives and as someone who is learning the art of colonial and imperial politics from James Otis Jr. And while he's learning this art, he's also someone who is sharpening his revolutionary rhetoric and prose by writing for newspapers. He's honing his arguments, as they say. So it sounds like that by 1770 or so, Stacey, Adams would have been in a good position to take over this role of major leader in fomenting revolution and spreading revolutionary rhetoric and ideas in both Boston and in Massachusetts more broadly? I think perfectly positioned, in fact. In 1768, because of much of the street protest and the unruliness generally in Boston, troops will be dispatched to calm the town. So they arrive in the fall of 1768. Adams will very soon thereafter, with friends, found a kind of news service to propagate stories most of them, it would seem fictitious, of encounters between the soldiers and the poor martyred citizens of Boston, in which, of course, the soldiers always look like the aggressors and the citizens look like innocents. And he and his friends will write these sort of lurid accounts of women sort of harassed and men aggressed upon and scuffles in the street, and they will send them throughout the colony. So they will dispatch them first to New York, where they're published, and from there to Philadelphia. And then only later will those accounts come back to Boston. So he founds this sort of uncannily modern kind of news syndicate to make it seem, and this is really on his mind very early on, to bind the colonies together, to make Boston's fate something which the other colonies can relate to. His feeling being that if one colony is under duress, if one colony finds that it has been occupied, the other colonies should rise in sympathy. 
And it seems he had some success with that in binding the colonies together, particularly when we look at the Boston Massacre of March 1770. It's my understanding that Samuel Adams played a really big role in helping all the colonies and posterity to think about those shootings on King Street as a real one-sided massacre where the British Redcoats just shot down a bunch of unarmed colonials. I think that's probably the best example of Adams at his protean best. He does seem to have helped to have named the evening. He very early on was active in helping to collect depositions of what had happened that night. There's really this race to get to Great Britain, the first accounts of what actually had happened in those few minutes on King Street. And obviously, it's a blur. Very few accounts actually tell the same story. He and his friends will race their depositions to London. Ultimately, they aren't the first to get those letters there. And then after the trials, Adams will spend six months vigorously retrying the case. In the course of the trials, all but two of the soldiers are exonerated. Adams will essentially relitigate the entire case in the Boston Gazette and sometimes the Boston Evening Post as if the trials never happened. So that as one of his opponents says, you know, are you really trying to say that four judges and 24 jurors were wrong and you alone are correct? And the answer seems to have been yes, that seems to be what he was trying to imply. But he will impugn the jurors, he will impugn the witnesses, he will go to any length to prove that this was a horrid massacre. You can see his long arm as well, and this is perhaps the most effective tool he uses afterwards in the massacre orations, which he helps to organize. So that every year after the massacre in March, there was a very lachrymose and very well attended and later published speech about what had happened that evening. And it becomes a kind of rallying cry in many ways. John Adams will tell us that no one ever read those orations with a dry eye. It was usually delivered by a very promising young man whom Adams had helped to recruit. We have one hilarious description of him trying to recruit John Adams, in fact, to deliver a massacre oration. So he's retailing this in every possible way to enforce the cause and to keep up the spirits of the people and to keep resistance alive. Now, it seems like every Boston and Massachusetts revolutionary who has a name that we remember has at least one confrontation with Thomas Hutchinson. And by the late 1760s, Thomas Hutchinson is the chief justice of the Massachusetts Superior Court, the highest court in the Bay Colony. He's lieutenant governor, and he's also going to later be the governor of Massachusetts. And when you read either contemporary accounts by revolutionaries or even accounts today, Hutchinson is the guy that is almost always painted as a villain. So, Stacey, could you tell us about Massachusetts' most famous loyalist and about the confrontations that Samuel Adams had with Thomas Hutchinson? I could go on at such length about Thomas Hutchinson, by which I'm wholly fascinated. Hutchinson and Adams have the world in common. They are both of them fifth-generation sons of Massachusetts. They have the same education, and they end up on diametrically different sides. And I should say that they start out at essentially the same position. Hutchinson although he is lieutenant governor, will also believe that the Stamp Act is taxation without representation. He just isn't in a position to be able to say as much. He is a very dutiful, very decorous man. He's a terrific and diligent public servant, and he needs to uphold his obligations to the crown. And that will lead him, obviously, in a diametrically different direction from Samuel Adams. There does seem to have been, from an early point, a scorn for or a distaste for Thomas Hutchinson. John Adams will tell us that when he and Samuel meet for the first time, which doesn't seem to have been until the early 1760s, they will agree from that very first meeting that no one poses a greater danger to American liberties than did Thomas Hutchinson. Even Mercy Otis Warren can't abide Thomas Hutchinson. There's just a tremendous distaste for him, I would assume, based on his success. He's a marvelously successful businessman. He has a thriving and close family. And he holds, alas, many political offices. And it is the aggregation of those offices that so offends the Adams men. Both John Adams and Samuel Adams at different points will compose screeds against Thomas Hutchinson where they just list all his offices. And it's basically like a long paragraph in each case. And if anything, I think John Adams is more apoplectic at Hutchinson's bouquet of offices than is Samuel. But it's oil and water. There's a definite disfavor in both directions. Hutchinson, for his part, is scornful of Adams because, as I said, he sees him as a sort of failure, as someone who he's doing this all about of disappointed ambition and because he's penniless. And so there are no real ideals in the picture as Thomas Hutchinson sees it. It's just that Adams hasn't found his place in society. And so he decides he's just going to kind of 
upset everything. And that just seems to be his modus operandi. He underestimates atoms and he misses the fact that there are actually ideas floating around, which are rather potent ideas and rather contagious ideas. And the ultimate showdown, I suppose, is the morning after the massacre, when Thomas Hutchinson is desperately trying to calm the town. There are still troops in Boston. Everyone is obviously frantic after the blood in the streets of the evening before. And a town meeting early on will send Adams over to the townhouse to confront Thomas Hutchinson to demand that he evacuate the troops. This is an incident which comes down to us mostly in the words of John Adams, who tells it much later and in a somewhat elevated style. He basically says this was an encounter worthy of Livy or Thucydides, but it is Adams essentially insisting that the soldiers be removed. Hutchinson tells him that he will remove one regiment, but not the other. Adams treks back to the town meeting, who reject that offer. And Adams goes for a second time and stands before Thomas Hutchinson, whom he later will say with some glee, looked weak as water and seems to tremble at the knees. And Adams successfully gets Hutchinson to agree to remove all of the troops from Boston. And this is seen as an enormous triumph of the people over the crown in the form of Thomas Hutchinson at that moment. But it does speak largely to the antagonism between these two men who obviously have been working together as members of the same government for some time. Thomas Hutchinson was a really successful imperial politician while we're talking about professional politicians in this revolutionary period. And while he held multiple colonial offices at the same time, which is actually a big part of the reason why Massachusetts to this day has very strict ethics rules about holding elective offices and working for the state, Hutchinson in the end He was forced out of Boston. He didn't feel safe. He resigned as governor and he sailed to England. And while he's in England in 1774, it was supposedly Thomas Hutchinson who met with King George III and identified Samuel Adams as, quote, the first to embrace American independence, end quote. So, Stacey, what do you make of this story and Thomas Hutchinson's supposed claims that it was really Samuel Adams who was the first American to embrace independence. Do you think this is a factual quote or do you think this is just another urban legend? That's such a great question. We have that line from Thomas Hutchinson himself. And I have to say, I mean, you can say whatever you will about Thomas Hutchinson, for whom I have a great weakness. He's an immensely honest and objective historian. And he comes home from that encounter with the king. I should say he's just returned to London. In fact, he's so newly returned, he doesn't feel like he's properly dressed and he's whisked off to meet the king. So he's really not even ready. He's just barely got off the ship. And he spends this rather enchanted time in the presence of the king. And then when he gets home, writes down his memories. So I would give rather a lot of credence to that report. The king doesn't realize that there are several Adamses. This is obviously a problem, not just for posterity, but at the time it was very confusing that there were all these Adamses. So Thomas Hutchinson is in a position of having to explain that there are several people with this surname. And he describes Samuel Adams to the king as being a man of inflexible temper, and as he puts it, pretended zeal for liberty. And again, it's this failure to believe that it's always a pretended zeal for liberty. They could not have possibly have been an authentic passion for liberty because he just doesn't see it. But he goes to his grave thinking that Adams was the prime mover and the first to advocate the idea of independence, about which I have a hard time, which I'll say in a minute. But I would say Adams returns that favor. I think Adams goes to his grave believing that Thomas Hutchinson was probably the man most singly responsible for American independence. Independence, it's such a tricky thing. It's not a word, obviously, anybody could utter. It was too dangerous a word. It was too combustible a word for a long time. The general theory seems to have been that Adams settles on the idea of independence in 1768 when he sees those troops march into his hometown. There's nothing on the record that would indicate that he comes to that decision that early, and that really would have been early. And for years, he seems bent on redress rather than any kind of revolution, certainly. When he mentions independence, he mentions it as something which should make Great Britain shudder. It's not something which he's embracing. It's something which he's using as a kind of boogeyman in a way. And if you actually look at the founders, every single one of them, I think, as late as early 1776 is shying away from the word independence, Franklin, Jefferson. John Adams even, no one uses that word until the very last minute. It really is the third rail. And obviously, a final rupture is something that nobody is really advocating in these years. So as much as Adams is penning articles, which seem seditious, is advocating for all kinds of things which are anathema to the crown officers, I'm not really sure he's thinking independence or an actual rupture with Great Britain until the 1770s. And the first time he really says, 
independence should be declared as the morning after Lexington and Concord. As we're speaking about perceptions of Samuel Adams as a ringleader of the revolution, Jeremy is curious to know what evidence we have that Adams was involved with and possibly even led the Boston Sons of Liberty. And in Boston, you do still hear stories about how if you ever needed a mob in 1760s and 1770s Boston, Samuel Adams was your man to organize one. You know, there's a wonderful bit of testimony from a Boston innkeeper who is paid for his information and is deposed about what is happening in the streets of Boston. And under oath, he essentially says exactly that, that Adams is able to raise a mob in the twinkling of an eye. There's no evidence whatsoever that he is the founder of the Sons of Liberty, certainly, or even that closely allied with them. It's shrouded in secrecy, obviously. There is the occasional hint of his involvement in things like a summons that the Sons of Liberty might send to John Adams, in which they would like his legal advice. And that summons comes with a postscript, and the postscript basically says, your cousin sends his regards, which is essentially a little, we're reminding you that you'll be doing this for us, kind of just to nail that one home. So he's clearly closely involved. The Boston clubs, of which there were many, tend to overlap. He's on very intimate terms with all of these people. But where he fits in that constellation of clubs, I think really difficult to chart. In some of the street theater early on, I don't know how complicit he is in the street theater later, certainly around the time of the massacre, around the time of various collisions with Thomas Hutchinson. I would say he's much more firmly in charge. Now, as Stacy mentioned, the American Revolution becomes a war in April 1775 with the battles of Lexington and Concord. And this shift from revolutionary movement to war causes a rejiggering among revolutionary leadership. Stacy. What impact did the revolution's transition into a war have on Samuel Adams's leadership and ring leadership in the revolutionary movement? I think once the resistance moves out of New England, Adams is relegated to a very different place. You can see as the entire New England delegation is making its way to the First Continental Congress, which they do at a very leisurely pace, you can see them realizing that they are going to need to take the back seat. You can see them realizing, being told over and over again, that New Englanders have this reputation with the rest of the colonies as being hot-headed fanatics, and that they're going to need to be very careful once they get to Philadelphia. And Adam seems to take that very much to heart. He's already, a, as we said, a stage manager, a more recessive character, but he clearly realizes that he's going to need to work behind the scenes and prove that the New Englanders are not the sort of goths and vandals that they are accused of being. They're not this sort of small-minded, Quaker-persecuting radicals whom the Southern colonies tend to believe them. So he takes something of a second seat. John Adams, of course, will later say that this is the reason that the Virginians write the declaration, why the declaration is proposed by a Virginia, written by a Virginian, and why the army is commanded by a Virginian, that the New Englanders really need to step aside. Adams is clearly most comfortable always in the more shadowy background. And when you hear him, you hear remarks like Thomas Jefferson saying that he spoke seldom, but so seldom that when he did speak, which was always with such crystalline logic, everyone listened very carefully. But he's much more conspicuous for being in the background. Often other delegates will talk about how they can see the long arm of Samuel Adams or how they suspect that something happened because Adams caused it to happen because it was all of it predetermined by the time it got to the floor of Congress. Could you tell us more about Samuel Adams, Continental Congressman? Because Adams did serve on several important committees, including the committee that would draft the first constitution of the United States, the Articles of Confederation. Exactly. And that can't happen fast enough for him. This is a moment in his life when he says, essentially, it is my fate always to be in a hurry, which had by no means seemed to have been his fate for decades. But now at this crucial moment is very much his fate. He can't understand what is taking so long on this front. Again, he's largely a behind the scenes player. We know relatively little of what he's doing, except there's a great deal of deal making. We have glimpses of him arguing congenially and at great length with, for example, the Georgia delegates. We know that when Congress first opens, he takes a rather masterful stand. One of the first questions that comes before the assembled delegates is whether they should open with a prayer and how they can possibly open with a prayer when they hail from such different religious backgrounds. And it is Adams, unexpectedly, who proposes that there's a terrific Episcopalian minister in town whom he hears is a marvelous speaker. Why shouldn't the Reverend Duchesne deliver the first blessing of the Congress? 
And the fact that this, of course, bigoted New Englander makes this gesture toward ecumenicalism just cements what a masterful statesman he is. That's a taste of what he's clearly thinking. We have relatively little on paper of how he operates over the next years. I've been doing some research into the records of the Second Continental Congress, and I really see three paths for the men who serve in Congress. One path is they serve their time in Congress, and that's if they ever go to Congress. There's actually a surprising number of people who are elected to Congress and never show up. But these men will be elected if they go to Congress, they attend Philadelphia, and then after their term is done, they just return home and kind of fade into the background. They return to whatever it is they were doing before the war broke out. And then there's this second path, which sees men like Samuel Adams's cousin John seeking out and being propelled into the national and international spotlight. These are men who take on roles such as ambassadorships and big offices, national offices within the new fledgling government of the United States. And then there's this third path for congressmen in that they return to their home states and they assume state offices. And this is exactly what we see Samuel Adams and his sometimes friend, sometimes enemy, John Hancock doing when they return home to Massachusetts and take on the roles of lieutenant governor and governor of the state. So, Stacey, would you tell us about Adams's role in state building and building and serving within the political and legal infrastructure of the new Bay State? Unlike many politicians and unlike many of his peers, Adams was very clear about what he wasn't good at. And it's really interesting. He's sitting in Congress and he's writing, you know, he's on any number of committees and he's constantly writing letters that say things like, I don't know anything about commerce. Why am I on this committee? And I'm terrible at maritime affairs. And why have I just been charged with ceremonial matters when I'm the world's least ceremonial person? So he's very much aware of his limitations. He's also not a committed federalist and very much a parochial New Englander. So as we know about the Constitution, has very mixed feelings about what has actually been created after the revolution. He will be harping for a long time on old world simplicity when the country is rushing forward to sort of a new opulence and a new commercialism, which is not precisely what he had in mind. So in terms of state building, his finest hour is really behind him. He has an additional problem when he goes back to Massachusetts in that he and John Hancock are on the outs. They have had a very on again, off again relationship for years. But post-revolution, John Hancock has done a great deal to blacken the reputation of Samuel Adams. So he goes back to Boston, but is not necessarily hailed there in all ways as the kind of patron saint that he had been, because Hancock will, for example, imply that he was part of the Conway cabal and had plotted against George Washington. He will do a number of things really to damage his reputation. So he becomes a sort of relic in a way of an earlier America, as opposed to a part of this new federation that he has helped to found. Samuel Adams died on October 2, 1803, at the age of 81. Stacy. How did Americans, and especially Americans in Boston and Massachusetts, react to the news that Samuel Adams had died? And what did they think his legacy was? How did they choose to remember him at the time of his death? This is the downside of having lived such a long life. He has somewhat outlived himself. He was already older than most of the other revolutionaries, so he really is sort of out of step with his contemporaries. He has had the poignant privilege of reading the first histories of the revolution, which is something you probably should never have to do because he sees how little they correlate to the revolution as he lived it. So in fact, he reads in Dr. Gordon's history of how he was involved in the Conway Cabal, which he was not involved in, to the point where Benjamin Rush is saying things like, you know, what does this mean about how history comes down to us? If all history is as contorted as this, what are we to make of, you know, Livy and Thucydides? So there's a definite sense that he's a prophet not really recognized in his time. At his death, there seems to be a scramble to get away from having to deliver the eulogy even. There are people who just don't want to even have to figure out how to make sense of this figure. There are a certain number of members of the House of Representatives who refuse to wear black armbands in his honor. So it seems to be a somewhat contentious legacy that he leaves. For years, he will still be spoken of as someone who was on a level with George Washington and as for someone who cleared the way for George Washington. And then later, he'll be largely forgotten as those sort of anarchic, rough and tumble days are better forgotten and left to the more high principled parts of the revolution. Your comment about how New Englanders like Samuel Adams and his associate, Dr. Joseph Warren, who died at the Battle of Bunker Hill, about how these men were on par with George Washington and how they worked to pave the way for Virginians to have significant power in the revolution 
and the new government. This is really an oft-told story in New England and in histories written by New Englanders that without us Yankees, there would be no independence and the Virginians like Washington never would have had a chance to shine and rise to the point where they had as much power as they did. I mean, this is just repeated in history after history, and it's come up several times today in our conversation. What's fascinating when you look back at the papers of John Adams is how many attempts he makes to try to supplant the Virginians, how essential it is to him to be able to say, you know, Samuel Adams and James Otis were doing this, that, and the other thing long before Patrick Henry was born. I mean, how important it is to him to insist on New England preeminence and how much rivalry there really must have been between those two colonies. And I'm not sure the rivalry has really ended. Now, before we move into the time warp, you've done a lot of research about Samuel Adams. And I'm curious what the one thing is you'd like us to walk away from our conversation, better understanding about Samuel Adams. So what's your one thing, Stacey? Can I have two things? I guess the one thing about Adams himself is how much he fails to conform to the stereotype. I think we all think of him as this sort of rabble-rousing fanatic. And from every account, and particularly, obviously, from John Adams, we have this description of a very genteel, very erudite man who is prudent and disciplined, who is of universally good character, who is steadfast and calm. And it's very much a description which is at odds with the perceived notion. And the prudence, I should add, is really crucial because he does really have an intuitive sense of time. He's constantly on guard. He's constantly vigilant, but he really seems to know exactly when to kind of twist the knife and when to object most ardently. And I guess the second thing I would say is that he's committed very early on to a point that I think he more than adequately proves, which is that people should never forget how much power they have to change their own destiny. Now it's time for the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. opinion, Stacey, what might have happened if Samuel Adams had chosen to remain loyal to the British crown and empire? How might the course of the American Revolution have been different if Samuel Adams had been a loyalist? This is the kind of like off-road driving you never get to do when you're writing biography. Would there have been a revolution without Samuel Adams? Of course. Would it have happened on the same timetable and with the same vocabulary? Possibly not. I mean, Massachusetts is out in front of the other colonies. Samuel Adams is out in front of Massachusetts and making sure that Massachusetts is out in front. And so the engine would have probably been a little bit different. I think that we could all probably agree that the committees of correspondence, which he founds, do more to unite the colonies and to establish a kind of electrical current along the coast of America than does anything else. And that that is the reason why the revolution can take off with such speed when finally it does. But would someone else have had that idea? I assume so. Stacey, What's next for you? I hear rumors that there might be a miniseries coming out on Apple Plus TV coming in the fall about Benjamin Franklin. I think I know what you're talking about. So probably in the fall, we'll come out an eight-part series based on my Franklin book, A Great Improvisation, which is about the eight and a half years that Benjamin Franklin spends at the Court of Versailles soliciting aid and munitions for the American Revolution, and in which Benjamin Franklin will be played by Michael Douglas. Is that who you imagined would play Ben Franklin? I can tell you that he looks, as you will soon see, he looks astonishingly like Benjamin Franklin. And that when John Adams tells Benjamin Franklin how truly he dislikes him, it sounds exactly like what John Adams was saying to Benjamin Franklin, because of course, these are the words we have from John Adams about how much he disliked Benjamin Franklin. If we have more questions about Samuel Adams, where's the best place to get in contact with you? My website, which is stacyshift.com, S-C-H-I-F-F.com. You can email me there and I answer all email and you can order books and sign books there as well. Stacey Schiff, thank you for helping us better understand the life and deeds of Samuel Adams. Thanks so much, Liz. This was such a pleasure. Samuel Adams believed that people should never forget the power they have to change their own destinies. This powerful idea wasn't just a belief of Samuel Adams. It also seems to have been an ideal and a code that he lived by. As Stacy related, Adams made his own destiny 
unable to settle into work in a mercantile firm or in an accounting house, Adams did something that few born in the American colonies ever did, which was to become a full-time professional politician. Now, politics as a profession is something that we recognize today as a professional calling. In our own time, lots of people work as professional politicians. But being a professional politician just wasn't something that most British colonists would have recognized as a profession. In fact, politics was often seen as a hobby or side pursuit of the wealthy and learned. Now, being a professional politician in Adams's time wasn't nearly as lucrative as it can be today. The 18th century wasn't a period of speaking fees, board appointments, or book contracts. So Adams never became wealthy as a politician. In fact, he often seems to have just barely kept his family afloat. Like many politicians, Samuel Adams started by holding local offices, such as market clerk and tax collector. From there, he worked his way up to an elective representative of the Massachusetts General Assembly, or its House of Representatives. And from there, Samuel Adams found himself elected to both the First and Second Continental Congresses, and then as lieutenant governor and governor of the state and commonwealth of Massachusetts. Now, despite the debts he accumulated as Boston tax collector from not collecting the taxes, Samuel Adams was an important and successful politician. He may not have had the national fame of his cousin, John Adams, but from what Stacy's research revealed, Samuel Adams seems to have had more fame than he may have wanted. Samuel Adams was a real behind-the-scenes politician. He was someone who knew which levers had to be pulled at the right time, someone who had the ability to reach across aisles and build coalitions across differences, someone who would get his hands dirty, so to speak, as he did with the Boston Massacre. Adams did the work he thought was necessary to transform Boston protests against imperial governance and overreach into a colonial-wide revolution. Plus, Adams also had a knack for putting the right people in place to see his vision and goals for a new independent nation come to fruition. So how did the revolution evolve from a series of protests into a revolution? It was because of the work of everyday Americans and men like Samuel Adams, who worked to organize his fellow citizens by crafting accessible narratives about what was happening with imperial politics and creating alliances between their diversity of viewpoints. For more information about Stacy, her new book, The Revolutionary, plus notes, links, and a transcript for everything we talked about today, view the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 350. Friends tell friends about their favorite podcasts. So if you enjoyed today's episode, please tell your friends about Ben Franklin's World. Production assistance for this podcast comes from my colleagues at Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios, Joseph Edelman, Holly White, and Ian Tonat. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to their other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com. Finally, I can't stop thinking about Stacy's remark about how Samuel Adams lived beyond his time. It seems like a really sad thought to me, and I wonder how often this happens to people. What do you think? Who do you think may have also lived beyond their time? Let me know. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios.